combine the seductive wiles of a courtesan with the untouchable majesty of a virgin goddess, holding these attributes in tension, so long as the powers of her youth endure. For when youth and beauty have gone, she will find that the place between, once occupied by tension, has become a wellspring of cunning and resourcefulness. with which Muad'Dib learned the necessities of Arrakis. The Bene Gesserit, of course, know the basis of this speed. For the others, we can say that Muad'Dib learned rapidly because his first training was in how to learn. And the first lesson of all was the basic trust that he could learn. It is shocking to find how many people do not believe they can learn. And how many more believe learning to be difficult? consistent. It depends in part upon the myth-making imagination of humankind. The person who experiences greatness must have a feeling for the myth he is in. He must reflect what is projected upon him. And he must have a strong sense of the sardonic. This is what uncouples him from belief in his own pretensions. The sardonic is all that permits him to move within himself. Without this quality, even occasional greatness will destroy a man. I don't know about that. Some of them maybe. I don't know about that. Some of them maybe. But I think some of them just don't have discipline. There's also an issue with momentum. You're not used to doing it. It's not a part of your life. It's not something that you're accustomed to pushing yourself. There's been many, 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 many days where I didn't want to work out. I just didn't feel like I had the energy. And I just forced myself. And I think there's very few people out there that know how to force themselves. That's a learned skill. You have to have, like, real rigid requirements of yourself where you don't allow yourself to back out of things. Of it and discipline's a big one. I just know 
of life. That's real.
take the safe path. The safe path leaves you stuck in quiet desperation. Almost every time. It's hell. It's hell. You're selling insurance or some other shit that you care zero about. It's hell. It's hell. It's hell. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a, take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a, take a path that's dangerous. Change is you have to put aside enough money to give yourself a window and then you have to have a plan and you have to spend all your waking hours outside of whatever shit job you do planning your escape and you have to come to the realization very clearly that you fucked up and you got yourself stuck so whatever you're doing you have to do it like your life depends on it and whether it is you're trying to be an author and you're working eight hours a day plus commuting plus family responsibilities or whatever time that you have you have to attack like you're trying to save the world you're trying to save your life you don't want to drown that one and a half hours a day that you have to write god damn you better be caffeinated and motivated you gotta go you gotta get after it you gotta go you gotta get after it get after it the only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a, take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a path that's dangerous. The only way you ever get where you want to go is to take a path that's dangerous. Take a, take a path that's dangerous. Everybody's different. Everybody's similar, but everybody's different. And your attitude. I did wrong. 
You're gonna say good. and the ones in between here's a new one for you the gonja bar it kills only animals
thinking over to machines in the hopes that this would set them free. 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 That only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. To enslave them. Thou shalt not make a machine the likeness of a human mind. Human unconscious is a pervasive need 
myth. There is in the beginning the divine bird which lays the egg of the world. And the egg splits. And the upper is the heavens, and the lower is the earth. So when the worlds are manifested, the Lord breathing out says, Pump. And when the worlds are withdrawn, the breath comes back.
This, you see, is not a pessimistic attitude, therefore, at all. To be able to realize that this world is simply a dream. A dancing play of smoke. Fascinating, yes, but don't leave on. Life is a bridge, says one of the Hindu sayings. Pass over it, but build no house upon it. And so, immediately you see that, this is responsible for the enormous gaiety of certain Hindu sages. But this is a thing that often puzzles Westerners. They expected that anybody who's an ascetic or a sage or something to be rather miserable, with a glum face. But on the contrary, you take this character who's going around these days, uh, Mahashi Mahesh, he's always laughing. Because he sits up, he looks on every side, and there is the face of the beloved, of the divinity, in everybody, in every direction, in everything, playing at being you.
directions of a favorite episode of I Love Lucy, I call them by saying, come in, little green man, little green man. It's simply a permitting. It's simply an invocation. And then they approach like a Nawari bear.
weeds of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Those are famous lines. That's sort of Christ the hippie, right? It's like, hey, let it all hang out. That's a little phrase. Do your thing, and everything will come to you. Let it all hang out. That's a little phrase. Do your thing, and everything will come to you. But that's serious, not the proper interpretation, because there's a kicker with this. And the kicker is this, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a lot different than the hippie thing. That's a lot different than the hippie thing, right? That's a lot different than the hippie thing. That's a lot different than the hippie thing, right? There's a very, very, very interesting idea. It's certainly one of the most profound ideas that I've ever encountered. If you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to survive, to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. If you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. You have to be all in in this game. Well, then, so that sets up the world around you. 
it, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim. And then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems. And if you solve them properly, then you stay on the path of your setting. And you can concentrate on the day. So that way you get to have your cake and eat it too. Because you can point into the distance, the far distance. Live in the day. Live in the day. Live in the day. And you can live in the day. That makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. Because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is back to Noah. Well, all hell is about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that. Because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that that you'll drown. I'm quite enamored of lobsters, as some of you might know, because I found out this just blew me away when I found it out. Just exactly how much continuity there was in the neurochemistry of human beings and the neurochemistry of animals. It's absolutely staggering. It's, it's the sort of thing that makes the fact of evolution something like self evident. Random mutation and natural selection is the only way you can solve the problem of how to deal with an environment that's complex beyond your ability to comprehend. I think what you do is you generate endless variants because God only knows what the hell's going to happen next. They all, almost all of them die because they're failures and a couple propagate. And you know, the environment keeps moving around like a giant snake. You never know what it's going to do next. And so the best you can do is say, well, here's 30 things that might work. And, you know, 28 of them are going to perish. Anyways, back anyway, to the lobsters. Back to so these creatures engage in, in dominance disputes. So it really is the toughest lobster that wins. And what's so cool about the lobster is that when a lobster wins, he flexes and gets bigger. So he looks bigger because he's a winner. It's like he's advertising that. And the neurochemical system that makes him flex is serotonergic. And you think, well, who cares? What the hell does that mean? Well, tell you what it means. It's the same chemical that's affected by antidepressants in human beings. And so like, if you're depressed, you're a defeated lobster. Like you're, you're like this, I'm small, I'm a, you know, things are dangerous, I don't want to fight. You give somebody an antidepressant, it's like, they stretch, and then they're ready to, like, take on the world again. Well, if you give lobsters who just got defeated in a fight serotonin, then they stretch out and they'll fight again. And that's, like, we separated from those creatures on the evolutionary time scale somewhere between 350 and 600 million years ago, and the damn neurochemistry is the same. And so that's another indication of just how important hierarchies of authority are. Akira. because without that beauty Akira loss of beauty is a catastrophe because without that beauty there's no call to higher being you know you this is also why you know I've, I've mentioned to people that they should clean up their rooms that's become quite the internet meme. But I'm really serious about it, because it's really hard to do that. And it isn't just that you clean it up. You also make it beautiful. Make it beautiful. Make it beautiful. Make it beautiful. Make it, make it beautiful. Make it beautiful. It's really hard to make something beautiful. Make it beautiful. It's really worthwhile. Make it beautiful. It's really hard to make something beautiful. Make it beautiful. It's really worthwhile. What's really cool is if you learn to make something beautiful, even one thing, if you can just make one thing in your life beautiful.
beautiful, and you've established a relationship with beauty, and then you can start to expand that relationship with beauty out into into the world, like into other elements of your life, and that is so worthwhile. It's just incredibly, crazily worthwhile to make it beautiful. To make it beautiful. To make it beautiful. To make it beautiful. Make it beautiful, and that's an invitation to the divine. To make it beautiful. You have to be daring to do that. It's to make it beautiful, and that's an invitation to the divine. To make it beautiful. You have to be daring to do that. It's that. People are terrified of it. People are terrified of color. They paint their walls beige. They're terrified of art. They buy some mass-produced thing because they don't want anybody laughing at them for their lack of taste. And they would get laughed at because they have no taste. But you have to, well, it's right, because what do you know, right? You have to develop it. And so you're going to stumble along and make mistakes to begin with. And you're going to show yourself, because if you buy four, oh, I think this is pretty. And you know, somebody comes over and goes, hey, what's up with you? It's kind of hard on your self-esteem, but but it's a stu you're stumbling towards the right, you're stumbling towards the kingdom of God. That's what you're stumbling towards when you try to make an aesthetic decision. Make it beautiful. Aesthetic. 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 That's what you're stumbling towards when you try to put something in your life that's beautiful and it's unbelievably worthwhile to do that. And you have to steer clear of the frauds and the con artists and all of that. And art is full of that, of course, because it's difficult to distinguish between the real thing and the fraud, but, but it's unbelievably worthwhile. Beauty is so valuable and, and we're so afraid of it. It's not the only pathway to the divine. Love is one of the most but beauty, especially for people who have an affinity for beauty, it's, it's like music. It's one of those things that you can't argue against. You can't even understand. It just hits you. It just hits you. It's like a vision of the potential future. But if we just got our act together and beautified the landmark, that's the place that we can inhabit and that would ennoble us. That's why Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is paved with gemstone. They're crystalline, they emit light. Yeah, it's the proper dwelling place for an enlightened consciousness. Beauty is the proper dwelling place for an enlightened consciousness. We ignore it at our, at our spiritual and economic peril. It's obvious. There's almost nothing more valuable than beauty. Sleeping Beauty goes to sleep, and the reason she goes to sleep is because he has parents who are quite cool, so they're pretty desperate to have a child, like so many people are, and they only have one child, like so many people do now. They don't want anything to happen to this child, because like, hey, it's a miracle. She's the princess. We're not letting anything around her. So they have a big christening party, and they invite everybody, but they don't invite Maleficent. Maleficent is the terrible mother. She's nature. She's like the thing that goes bump in the night. She's the devil herself, so to speak. She's everything that you don't want your child to encounter. So the king and queen say, well, we just want to invite her to the christening. It's like, good luck with that. That's an eatable story. The eatable there is the mother who devours her child. I will be protected him or her. So that instead of being strengthened by an encounter with the terrible world, they're weakened by too much protection. And then, and then when they're let out into the world, they cannot live. And that's the story of Sleeping Beauty. And they apologize to Maleficent when she first shows up. They say, well, you know, they have a bunch of half-witted excuses why they don't invite her. We forgot. It's like, I don't think so. You don't forget something like that. And she kind of makes that point. It's like the whole horror of life. You don't forget about that when you have a child, that's for sure. You might wish that it would say a day that you do not forget about it. The question is, do you invite it to the party? And the answer is, it bloody well depends how unconscious you want your child to be. And if you want your child to be unconscious, well, then you have the added advantage that maybe they won't leave home. And so you can take advantage of them for the rest of your sad life. Instead of going off to find something to do for yourself, of course, you can take revenge on them if they do have any impetus towards courage that you sacrificed yourself 30 years ago and want to stamp out as soon as you see it develop in your child. That's another thing that would be quite pleasant. Be quite pleasant. Be quite pleasant. That's another thing that would be quite pleasant. Be quite pleasant. Be 
quite pleasant. So that's what happens in Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, well, none of this is pleasant. And nothing that happens in that story is pleasant. So Sleeping Beauty, she's naive as hell. They put her up in the forest and have her raised by these two-shoes fairies. And then the first idiot prince that wanders by, she falls in love with so badly that she has post-traumatic stress disorder where he rides off on his horse. That's what happens. Then she goes into the castle and she's all freaked out because she met the love of her life for like five minutes. That's when the spinning wheel, that's the wheel of fate, pops up and she pricks her finger. They try to get rid of all the spinning wheels. They try to get rid of all the wheels of fate with their pointed end. But she finds it, pricks her finger, and falls down. Punch. Well, she wants to be unconscious. No bloody wonder. She was protected her whole life. She's so damn naive that her first love affair just about kills her. She wants to go to sleep and never wake up. Never wake up. Never wake up. She wants to go to sleep and never wake up. And so that's exactly what happens. And then she has to wait for the prince to come and rescue her. Well, you think, how sexist can you get? That's a boneheaded way of looking at the story because the prince isn't just a man who's coming to rescue the woman. The prince also represents a woman's own consciousness. Without that forward-going, courageous consciousness, the woman herself will drift into unconsciousness and terror. All she can do is lay there and sleep, like the sleep of the naive and damned. She has to wake herself up and bring her own consciousness, her own masculine consciousness, into the forefront so that she can survive in the world. That's partly what's implicit in this idea, is that unless the woman is taken out of man, so to speak, that she isn't a human being, she's just a creature, and that's partly what's embedded in this story. So you don't want to read it as a patriarchal. You don't want to read anything. Akira. He's got clout. People want to know how to stop the laziness and they want to know how to stop the procrastination. Akira. He's got clout. People want to know how to stop the laziness, and they want to know how to stop the procrastination. They have some idea in their head, you know, some kind of a, a vision of what they want to do, but they don't know where to start. And so they say, hey, where do I start? And, and when's the best time to start? 
Where do I start? And, and when's the best time to start? Where do I start? And, and when's the best time to start? And I have a very simple answer for that. Here. Get better. Take that first step and make it happen. 